Yeah, so this week, actually, this uh, idea of, of ingesting and being a flamingo actually ties in pretty nicely with today's message as we're walking through uh, the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6 because there are some things that have to get ingested in order to be of value. There are certain things that, that they need to be so deeply ingrained in you that you need to, um, you need to be able to uh, just like have it out when you're, you know, like when I was in elementary school, they, like honestly, I don't know about you, but I thought that catching on fire um, as a person was going to be a much larger issue than it actually is because they spend so, <laughs> they spend so much time on what what are the three words stop drop, and roll. stop drop and roll I'm like man something about being an adult people must just burst into flames a lot like I don't know what's going on but you had to have that because you didn't want to ever catch on fire and be like I have no I don't what am I supposed to no you had to know boom so that when the moment comes you didn't even think about it you just stopped dropped and rolled Holly you're a teacher you had a lot of kids bursting into flames at Clark High School. Some, not as many as, uh, still, see, I'm like, not as many as you would, not as many as you would think. Um, yeah, uh, but it allows you, I guess it does allow you to be a little more um, courageous, right? Like, if I'm, I'm like, not as afraid of fire, because I'm like, it's okay, I know how to handle this. Even if I burst into flames, stop, drop, roll, I'm ready to go. But it, you need to ingest some things in order for them to be of value. And so as we get close to the end of our series, Ephesians, uh, and this week, so Paul is going to change gears a little bit. Um, but what we're going to talk about today is something that has to be ingested so much that it is able to just kind of come out of us at a, at a moment's notice. And so let's look at what Paul's, um, what we're talking about today. Paul says in the second half of Ephesians 6, verse 17, um, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of of God, And so this is a, um, we're obviously going to talk about the sword of the spirit. We're going to talk about the word of God this morning. And, and, and as we get into them, there are several clarifications that we need to make. And then we're going to look at a story that sort of shows for us how we, how we apply it and what we do with it. Um, one thing I want to clarify, because there's actually been some debate amongst theologians in this. It says, um, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Um, some people think that the sword is the spirit, but, but well, here's what we want to recognize, that the spirit um, is giving us a gift. The sword of the Spirit is something given to us by the Word of God. And so um, what I want to do right now is just a, a kind of illuminate for you, and, and we can do deeper study on this at another time, but one of the roles of, of the Holy Spirit. Um, the role of the Holy Spirit is to illuminate text, uh, Scripture, text to you. That's, that's one of the, the roles of the Holy Spirit in dwelling us, is that as I read Scripture, the Holy Spirit can make it. So I don't know if you ever had a verse that you've read, and you're like, I don't really know what that means, and then you've been, you pray, and then you come back to it another time, and it just lights up, and you go, oh my gosh, I get it. So that's the Holy Spirit illuminating texture to, uh, text to you, Scripture to you. And so the sword of the Spirit is, is the Holy Spirit equipping you with Scripture um, for, for, a, for a purpose. And so now we're going to take a look at what that purpose is, and we're going to begin to make a few clarifications. First, I want us to notice that there's a change in the, the role of the piece of armor this week over all the other pieces. All the other pieces were primarily defensive pieces. We did say that the shield of faith can be used offensively. Filled, um, the shield of faith can help us move forward by pushing back the enemy, but it's primarily a defensive, a defensive piece of armor. This week, the sword of the spirit is primarily an offensive battle. And, and sword, you might be thinking really sweet, awesome, like the long swords um, that, that I would love to carry. I just think it would be cool to be guys. Just That was my job is to have a sword with me. But um, the sword that the Roman soldier used is actually um, much sharp, shorter, uh, more like a dagger. It is razor sharp, and it is sharp on both sides. This is why we're going to see a scripture in a minute that talks about scripture being a, a double-sided sword. So it's a much smaller, be used in close hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, and so it's a primarily an offensive weapon. But what I want to be careful about is I think that unless we take some time to understand and clarify some things about, about what the Lord wants us to know about using the, the scripture as a weapon, we can get way off base, and this is actually a very dangerous teaching. And so um, I want to clarify uh, what the weapon is for, how the weapon is used, how, how it is not used, and some things that go, that go into it, which, which is the next couple of clarifications, which the first one is that, um, and this is so important, flamingos, um, scripture is only an effective weapon if it is used in context and applied correctly, right? And so we have this tendency to pull half verses or little phrases out of Scripture that make us feel good or that validate our positions or that make it really easy to be us, and that's, that's not healthy. We have to be award using what I call the Hobby Lobby verses. And so um, we go into it, and we go, oh, well, that was, on, it was inside of a frame at Hobby Lobby. Clearly, that's all that I need to know. And we begin to use these verses out of context. We misapply them. Um, and then a couple of things happen. One, people get, people get wounded because we tell them half-truth. And so they go, well, I thought God was about something that he's not. But we also begin to question or doubt God, right? And so um, let's look at a couple of ones. Paul says in Philippians, um, 
a, a verse that a lot of people know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So right after church, y'all gather me because Christ strengthens me. I'm going to run a three-minute mile. <laughs> Joel was the first one to laugh. Let me tell you, three-minute mile, if I'm driving, maybe, right? Like, we have to understand, we say that to people. We go, you can do all things through God who strengthens you. That's not what Paul meant. I'm not slam dunking a basketball this afternoon on a 10-foot rim. It's not going to happen. I'm not passing up a second cheeseburger at my dad's house at dinner tonight, right? Like, it's not, it isn't happening. But we, when we tell people that it is, then, then people get angry. Got, well, I thought I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I prayed to Christ. I believed in Christ. I trusted in Christ. And then I couldn't do it. Paul is actually referencing something very specific in Philippians when he said it, where he's talking about, I am, I am able to be a bold witness for Christ. I'm able to withstand hardships. I am able to, to witness boldly for the faith, even in the face of persecution, because of Christ who strengthens me. That verse is better. I can do all this through Christ who strengthens me. Or people go, we just tell people like, all things work together for those who love God. Um, one, all things work for God's glory, but two, finish the verse, for those who love God and are called according to his purposes. And so there's a, I've told you this before, but I saw a sign that I'm like, dude, I need to, I, we need to post that around here. It said, everything happens for a reason. Sometimes the reason is you're an idiot and you make bad choices. And I'm like, yes, right? Like, like, if we're going to choose to live a life not surrendered and completely disobedient to God, then we don't get to claim the promises or the victory of God. And so when, so scripture is a powerful weapon, and we're going to see against whom, but only when it is used in context and applied appropriately. Um, and so we have to be really careful. And here's, you go, well, Aaron, how do I, how do I know if I'm applying it co correctly? Here's a quick test. Who is glorified or made awesome by the scripture that you're quoting and using defensively in that, in that setting. We're going to see Jesus in a little bit who it glorifies. But scripture, the role of God, the chief end of man is to glorify God. Um, we work for God's glory. And so if the scriptures I'm quoting are to make me look good and make you look bad, or to make me more comfortable so that I don't have to do hard things, then I'm likely misapplying the holy scriptures. Because scriptures are about bringing glory to God's name, making us more like him. And so also, um, so scripture is used as a weapon against the enemy, not against the people that God loves. Don't shoot the hostage. That's not a thunderstorm. Sometimes this bottom speaker um, chimes in and just has thoughts. And so that's what that is. Sorry about that. Um, uh, and so use the... the, the Lovingly, the, the role of Scripture through the Holy Spirit is to, to, to convict us and not, not condemn us. And so one of the things I want to say right out of the gate, if you're using Scripture as a, as a weapon against other people, as a bludgeon to other people, if you are using Scripture um, to, to, to shame or to beat people, then you are not being a tool of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit seeks to convict and to, to liberate from sin, but to, to free us in, in Christ and to usher us in to the, to the, the, the joy of, of following God and living, living the life he called us to. Um, Paul clarifies this for us in um, Romans chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. You may think you condemn such people, uh, people who don't know Christ, um, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself for you who judge others do these very same things. And, and we know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that God's kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? That's the new living. In the NIV it says God's, it is God's kindness that leads us to repentance. So Paul's, Paul says, and I wish you would quit beating around the bush, um, don't be a big fat hypocrite and beat other people with scripture, making them feel ashamed and wicked and unlovable when God has reached out and connected to you in mercy time after time after time. Um, the goal is that we use scripture to convict of sin. And so the, the, the battle then in our life is, is we're, we're kind of like surgically removing sin from our own life so that we can, we can live and move and breathe more freely as Christ intended to. We are not called to use this to, to bludgeon other people. Um, but then even to other believers in Galatians 6, 1, uh, Paul says, brothers and sisters, if anyone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Um, man, we could spend a whole week on that, but I promise I'm not adding more weeks to the series. Um, but man, if I could just get us to embrace that word gently, right? Um, 
Yeah. I just, it is not our anger. It is not our anger or our rage or our outrage rage that, that opens up the heart to the kindness and the beauty of God. If, if anything, it deepens the calluses, right? And so the same kindness that God reaches out to you, just make sure that you're extending that to other people as you go through. Um, even with a struggling brother, be gentle. The word is not a weapon against people, but the scripture does have a role. For uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So this is the role of scripture, but, but it's, it's shaping every believer in the image of God. Even the rebuke is done in love. All of these things are done in love. So even the rebuke is, is done in love and done gentle like you might do with a kid. It is, it is firm, it is honest, but it is, it is loving in context and correctly applied. Um, don't manipulate scripture to make your point. Don't manipulate scripture to make you comfortable. Parents, as an aside, if you're going to use scripture in the discipline of your children, and you, you should, you ought to use everything as a way to train and point your children, to please, please, please do not use scripture as a punishment or do not use scripture manipulatively or out of context to make, some, to make some point that you want to make. Because when you do that, you make scripture distasteful and, and, and hard to your kids. And we want our children to see scripture for what it is. Life-giving, beautiful, hopeful, right? So please be, please be very, very careful with that. Um, use it to make others more like Christ and to lead them towards, towards freedom. And now, because it wouldn't be Aaron if I didn't get up in our kitchen a little bit, um, the final clarification I want to make as we're talking about how do we use this sword, uh, I want to just say that the sword of the Spirit, you will find, is, is often used in two places. It is often used to slay our enemy, and then outside of our enemy, the person that the sword of the Spirit is most often used against is ourselves. We use the sword of the Spirit as a tool to actively slay the flesh in our own life. We use the tool to help us be crucified like Christ and made alive uh, in him. Satan's big trip is to cause you to, to doubt God or to, to cheapen the gospel or to believe that somehow you're self-sufficient. So he whispers lies that will build up the flesh. And, and we use scripture as a tool to remind us that, f that, that unchecked Aaron is the, is the problem. And so I need to be actively slaying the flesh so that Christ can live through me. And so the sword of the spirit, as we're reading the word of God, it is first and foremost a tool that should be used to... Um, to, to, to get rid of that which is decaying and, and, and killing me. Um, seeing Scripture as a tool to feed others misses the primary point of Scripture and also robs it of its real power. This, Jesus warned us really clearly of this. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's. And so notice, there's a clear command to use Scripture as a sword against self, to, to use it as a, a tool or a, a, a way to, to process how am I doing at, at surrendering to Christ and following him and growing, growing towards him. Um, there's this warning against becoming a Pharisee, which a Pharisee is one who, who uses Scripture to glorify self and to, and to marginalize others when Scripture is designed to actually slay the self and glorify God in, in our own eyes and then through the life that we, through the life that we live. Um, but what's dangerous what, or what should alarm us in that is um, according to the measure, with the measure you use, what we measure to you. And so if we're using scripture as a bludgeon for other people going, you're violating the scripture, you're violating the scripture, I would remind you that, that Paul says that Romans 3.23 says that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in James chapter 2, James, um, he, he warns us that um, if we have broken even one piece of the law, but we're using the law as the measuring stick, then we're accountable to the, to the whole law. And so this is, this teaching from Jesus is where James gets that idea, that James is saying, listen, if you're going to use the law, if you're going to use scripture as, a, as the measuring stick for righteousness for other people and as a reason to not give grace, then you just need to be ready 
because then God's going to go, okay, I guess we're doing it by the rule. Let's go over all the places that, that you've broken it. And so we have to be really, 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 really careful. Scripture should produce in us a desire for holiness. Absolutely, as I, as I read Scripture and I see what the life of the believer is like surrender to God, it should make me desire holiness. However, it should also create humility and grace, mercy, or gentleness. It should produce grace. And so with these clarifications out of the way, um, let's sum this up. So Scripture is used as a weapon against the enemy, not the people he attacks, and it's primarily used to cut the cancer of sin out of our own lives. And so I want to look at a story of that in action. Um, and as we do, we're going to see how Satan works, a little bit about what to be on guard against, uh, and then I'll read us, I'm going to read us the whole passage, and then we'll put a few verses up on the screen as we go through it and, and kind of unpack it. Um, so let's read, and then... Uh, the big thing I want you to notice is this, though. Well, let me read the passage, and we'll come back to that. We're going to read Matthew 4, chapter 1 through 11. So then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So again the devil took him into a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So here's what I want us to notice. Satan attacks to us by appealing to things that will enlarge the flesh. We're, we're going to look specifically and unpack them um, really briefly, but the thing that I want you to notice is the first appeal is, um, hey, you're hungry, let's, let's, let's feed you. Um, why don't you throw yourself down off of this temple where all these people are gathered and let the angels catch you and prove to them that you are who you say you are without having to work for it. Like, let's just, let's just show them. And, and look, I will give you all of these kingdoms to rule. He's, he is alluring, to, he's, he's um, inviting us to appealing to things that will enlarge the faith. And Christ responds with scripture that slays the flesh and glorifies, and glorifies God. And so this is something we're going to keep our eyes on. This is consistent all the way throughout Scripture, even to the end of his life, right? Jesus in the garden says, um, Lord, if you're willing, take this cup from me, which would have been spare the flesh, but not my will, but yours be done. So I, I sacrifice the flesh for your sake. Um, and so let's look at the specific attacks that he walks through. Verses 2 and 3, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, and the tempter came and said to him, if you're the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Uh, Satan appeals to the appetite and to self-indulgence here. Uh, so listen, this might sound like a joke because of who I am <laughs> a little bit, but for real, be on guard when you're hungry. Be on guard when you're hungry. Satan knows when we're vulnerable, when we're short-tempered, when we're likely to, likely to fail, and something happens to our self when we're angry. You've seen those Snickers commercials. You're not yourself when you're hungry. Um, it's true. And so Satan will oftentimes tempt us with things uh, in that season where we're hungry. And so I'm saying that we need to take care of ourselves physically in that regard. Now, as I'm working against right now, it is obvious to overcorrect on that and go, see, that's why I'm overweight. It's spiritual. I just want to never be tempted. No, it's, <laughs> that's not true. Don't go home and be like, Pastor Aaron said I get to be fat. He did not. Um, but let me just tell you real quickly, there's a reason why fasting is so effective. Because food is like one of the most, like, like primal and immediate cravings of the flesh. And so when we fast, what we're saying is, I'm going to deny the flesh that thing that satisfies it so that I can hear directly from the Lord. And so what Satan is trying to do here, Jesus is fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and Satan's like, you're denying the flesh so that you can hear from God. Let, why, don't you just, why don't you just eat and satisfy that craving? See, the way that a fast works is the cravings are a reminder, go to God. And so I fast, I go throughout my day, and I go, oh, I'm really, really hungry. Stop and pray. 
and just go, Lord, man doesn't live by bread alone here. I want to I wanna be fed by you. And, you, and, and that's the way that a fast uh, works. And so Satan is trying to, to block that intimacy and that connection with God. That's what, he, that's what he's always after, is disconnecting you or blocking your ability to hear from the Spirit. And so Jesus' response to him, he says, well, man does not, as it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's quoting Deuteronomy 8.3. And he's pointing away from the human appetite back to God. Self-denial, he's, he's choosing self-denial for the sake of hearing God and in a trust of God's ability to provide. Now listen, he could have twisted scripture to make it work so that my boy could have had a snack. He could have said, well, look at what Jesus, look at what, you know, God, this is, you did make it rain bread. Am I right? Like that whole manna thing in Exodus? Pretty cool. What if this is just that, right? But, but, but Jesus knew bigger the mission of God. So listen, you can't just pick up a verse or two on Sundays while you're here and think that you're ready to wield the sword of the Spirit. You, you, need to be, you need to have a discipline of regularly being in the Word, studying the Word, knowing what it means, unpacking it, ingesting the Word, because Jesus knew this is bigger than that. I'm, I know what God has called me to, and so no temptation from the devil, no matter how tempting, can distract me from it. But that comes from Jesus' habit of, 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 of regularly being alone with, with Father. And so um, it would have been easy for Jesus to get away, um, but instead he goes, nope, I know what Father has called me to. He has said to fast and to trust in his ability to provide. And Satan's like, well, look, I can provide for you really easy. And he's like, but no, this is about God and God doing it supernaturally. And so he waits. The next temptation, the devil takes Jesus to the holy city and sets him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands they will bear up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And so um, one of the things I will tell us here, Jesus, uh, Satan is quoting Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12 here. But one of the reasons why we have to be in the word, we have to be studies the word, we have to be ingesting the word, is you need to know this in this battle that we're in. Um, Satan knows the word better than you. Satan knows the word better than you. He knows it well enough to be able to twist it and manipulate it and make it sound really, 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 really good. And so um, there's this crowded temple, and what he's doing is he's telling Jesus, like, you wanted to believe you're the Messiah, bro? Let me read you this messianic prophecy. This is what Scripture prophesies about the one who's the Messiah. I I'm not asking you to violate Scripture. I'm asking you to prove that you are who you say you are. And, and what he's saying is, I'll quit. I'll go away. Just throw yourself off. And, 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 and if you're really the Messiah, God will catch you. His angels won't let you get hurt. And then everybody will know for sure. Think of how much easier your job will be. And so oftentimes Satan will also appeal to us with shortcuts to the fulfillment that God promises. Right? Jesus said, right, but that's not the plan that the Father put in motion. The Father has said that I will, I will bear the sins of the world in my death and liberate them that way. They will see my Messiahship, not in the way, not just the way that I live, but also in the way that I die. And so that's not what that scripture means, you big fat liar. And it is okay to call Satan a big fat liar. Um, and so Satan tries to tempt, but look what Jesus says. Yeah, right. Um, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's Deuteronomy 6.16. Jesus was so clear on his assignment that even manipulated scripture out of context didn't sway him. Um, my question is, are we willing to become students of the word so that we too can be surrendered that way? Where people try to misrepresent scripture and you know, I mean, you can like give a relation, but you don't just have to walk into Hobby Lobby and be like, can I talk to a manager? Not what that means, right? Like you don't have to be that guy, but you do need to know for your life. And when Satan tempts you, just go, no, I'm not, I'm not taking the, I'm not taking the easy way out on this one. I know what God has asked me to and called me to, and I'm going to, I'm going to trust him. So let's look at the last temptation. Again, the devil takes him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And then Jesus' response, uh, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. So Satan appeals to the pride here, to, to the, the desire to be known and accepted. He's like, Jesus, I'll make you famous, man. He's like, I'll just, I'll let you win. I'll go away. I'll surrender. All I need you to do is worship me. I just need you to, to tell me that I'm, that I'm good. 
And so Satan still works this way. Now, you may go, Aaron, I've never been on a mountain with, with the devil and had him tempt that right. The way that he does it now, rather than that, um, because he knows you and I aren't promised all the kingdoms of the world, he would not tempt us with that. But what he does do is he tempts us with more things um, that would allow us to, to ignore God and elevate self. And, and in doing that, he's saying, he may not be saying worship Satan, but he is saying, why don't you worship you, right? Um, take liberty with the truth so you don't get in trouble. Um, you don't need to, I mean, 10%, that's a lot. You don't need to give. Just, you just know, you, know, you tell God thanks every time you get a paycheck. That's enough. Don't worry about, don't worry about that whole tithe thing. Um, yeah, you don't, need to, you don't need to share your faith with anybody. You can just, yeah, I know, it's uncomfortable. That's not the way God, God made you, right? Um, you can just pick and choose. So much has changed, and there's a cultural nuance all over the New Testament. You don't need to worry about those things or try to suss out from God what he's actually calling you to. Just don't, just don't worry about it. He's a God of grace anyway. In every one of those situations, they sound super spiritual, but what they're doing is asking you to bend the knee to the idol of self. They're asking you to go, my comfort, my ease, that's the most important thing, and that's not what God wants. And so Jesus, um, worship simply means assigning ultimate worth to and sacrificing excessively for something, and Jesus knows I'm, not, I'm called to do that to God and to God only, and so that also is, is our call. Nothing should take preeminence, not even a shortcut to the desired end. I must only live for Father, and so we have to ask ourselves if we're as, if we're as allegiant. If we're as allegiant. And so we need to have things so deeply ingrained into our soul um, that not just our feathers are, 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 are pink, but maybe we smell a little bit like shrimp too. But the word is so deep in our heart that it just, it just comes out at a moment's notice. We need to be ready to just, as soon as we smell smoke, stop, drop, roll, right? No risks. And so... Um, we need to devote verses in context to our memory, ready to slay the flesh and conquer the enemy. And so there's this cool thing at the end of, because we're, I think we're worried about the cost of following Jesus. But look, Matthew 4, 11, the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. And then at Jesus' cross, um, he was proven Lord, King of Kings and, and Lord of Lords. The, the, at, at whose name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Um, Jesus, through obedience, found the right path to everything Satan promised, right? And so this is my promise to you. Not that it will go easy. I think we can look at the model of Jesus' life and know that it didn't. It was hard. But everything that God has promised will come true. And the joy is for those who are willing to, to just trust him enough to be, to be obedient. So Jesus leaves there and he lives obediently. He taught correctly and he applied the scripture. And in the end, um, here we are, 2,000 years later, worshiping him. And so I guess today I would just challenge you as we take up the sword of the spirit. Oftentimes um, we memorize just enough scripture to make ourselves really dangerous. And so I would say make sure you're dangerous to the right, to the right person. And that only comes with solid training. Um, don't shoot the hostage. Uh, scripture should increase your capacity and desire to love those made in the image of God, even if they have not yet surrendered to God. Um, we move with love and with grace and with, mer with mercy. And the scripture is used primarily to remove the log out of our own eye so that we might be free to help our brothers with the dust that's in theirs. And so, Lord God, thank you for the gift of your, your word. We believe, Lord, that it is, um, it is the power that we need for, um, for life. We confess to you that we are often flippant with it and we take it casually and we don't use it as uh, diligently as, as we should, as correctly as we should. Um, we weaponize it and that's, that's unfortunate. We confess that, we repent of it and we ask you to heal us and to make us new. And Lord, we just pray that we would become a people who are desperate and hungry for your word that we would take it in all of it, even the hard parts, that we would wrestle with it and allow the Holy Spirit um, to convict us and to bring us into alignment with your word. You're a good, good father. And thanks for how you love us. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Aaron. That was great.